Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Transportation Insights. I'm very excited to be here today with Lars Jensen. Lars, could you give a short introduction uh, of yourself, please? I've been an analyst in the industry for almost 20 years, uh, half of it uh, working for Maersk Line, and the last roughly 10 years as being an independent advisor and analyst. Uh, my key passion here is simply trying to look at what happens in the container shipping markets and try to devise what will happen in the coming months and years. Cool. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Listen, I'm, I'm very, uh, very excited here to discuss, um, discuss uh, the capacity in today's market because we've seen tremendous changes on that front since uh, COVID-19 started. And I know that, you know, the, the outlook has just uh, continued to become more and more gloomy. But could you give a little bit of uh, perspective to the listeners as to how much are we really looking at here? Is it is it 5% down from last year or what's going on in the market? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the good thing about looking at capacity is it is the best uh, real-time indicator we have of what is happening with demand. As you know, all demand data are backwards looking. So what the carriers do, we have to surmise, is because that's the demand uh, drop they see. And just within the last 14 days, we have gone from two blank sailings globally to 212 blank sailings as of counting right now. So it's ramping up quickly. If we translate that into actual capacity, the first thing to note is this is widespread. This is on all trade lanes, all continents, everywhere. It's all carriers. The largest drawdown we see is obviously in the near term, uh, four to five weeks. But a lot of blank sailings actually extend all of Q2. If we look only at the next four to five weeks, what we're looking at is a 30 percent, three zero percent drawdown on Asia Europe capacity. That's the largest drawdown we see. But on most other trades, what you are looking at is basically across the board, 20 percent drop in capacity in the near term weeks. And do you have any any idea whether you or, or do you want to care to give any speculation as to will it continue to get worse or? Any well, you, you can say worse from which perspective. If worse means will we see more blank sailings, I would definitely tend to say yes. Mm. Because if you start to look at why are the carriers making such aggressive drawdowns, there, there are a couple of ways to look at it. The obvious one would be to say if demand drops, clearly you pull out capacity so you save some cost. And yep. yes, you will save billions from this, but that's not the primary purpose. <clears throat> The primary purpose is to try to prevent a catastrophic drop in rate levels. If you look back to what happened in the financial crisis, the carriers did not aggressively pull capacity for many months. And as a consequence, rate levels just plummeted. And I just ran the financial analysis over the weekend. If we see the demand drops that we're seeing now, and we are also seeing a, a catastrophic drop in rates, the carriers yeah. combined would lose $23 billion this year. So eyes on the price here for the carriers, that is avoid catastrophic drops in rates. They did have a small trial run when you had the virus outbreak in China just after Chinese New Year. They also aggressively pulled capacity and it actually worked to the effect that you did not see a catastrophic drop in rate levels. Rates dropped, sure, but that was more or less in line with what you would have expected seasonally anyway. So yeah. it actually worked for them. And that's why I think going forward, we're going to see more uh, aggressive cuts in capacity because the carriers have to make sure rate levels don't collapse. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I, mean, we, uh, I can support uh, from a rate level point of view that that's what we're seeing as well. But, but at, at, at the other side, we're also seeing some rate movements that are going in the complete opposite uh, direction. If I take uh, Europe uh, back to, to China main ports or, or even Far East, there's some uh, substantial rate upticks and uh, I mean yes we have picked up the the imbalance uh, of boxes and uh, and uh, that that is really um, the key thing that we're struggling with the availability of uh, equipment right well, what's your thinking around this topic and and yeah. how do you see that evolves uh, over yeah the next I, 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 I think you're on to the right aspect here because when we talk about capacity going forward it's actually not the vessel capacity we should be so focused on apart as an indicator for what happens to demand the real bottleneck in capacity is going to be on the equipment itself on the containers uh, we saw increases for example in the backhaul rates from Europe back to Asia already a month ago 
And that was a direct consequence of the China virus outbreak, which of course then disturbs all the usual repatriation patterns of empty containers. What we are seeing now is genuinely unprecedented. Mm. Uh, moving empty containers around is, let's call it a large elaborate dance, uh, spending $10 billion moving equipment around, getting it to the right places. And under normal circumstances, that is a complicated effort made easier by the fact that we roughly know what the trade imbalances are on all the given trade lanes. Hmm. But with the complete crashing halt of the global economies, all of those usual rules of thumb have gone completely out of the window. What is the trade imbalance going to be right now between, say, Asia and Europe? Right now, I would venture the view that nobody knows because yeah. we don't know what demand is going to be at either end. So all the usual ways of moving containers around will not work. And that means, realistically speaking, at least to a, to a certain degree of accuracy, nobody have the slightest idea where empty containers are going to be needed one or two months from now. That mm -hmm. is going to create a problem of equipment literally everywhere. You will see shortages in places where you usually never have shortages. You might have huge piles of excess empty equipment in places where usually you have a deficit. And that doesn't even have to be between uh, different parts of the world. That could be internally in individual countries because all the usual repatriation patterns goes completely out of kilter. Uh, and then add to that, you will have a substantial part of the equipment fleet that will simply not be accessible. What you're seeing right now is a lot of importers, they cannot take delivery of their cargo. So it gets stuck in ports yeah. or when they do take delivery of cargo, their warehouses are full. So they're just piling up the containers in front of their warehouses with cargo in them. So obviously a significant portion of the equipment fleet is simply not going to be available. So I have uh, uh, probably a million questions related to this. <laughs> let's see. So, so in some, uh, some sort of um, sense, I feel it's really, really gloomy days for the carriers. But is there anything here within the, the, the description of the, the market that you, you're currently sort of painting for us? That is, is it favorable for the carriers? Is there anything that they can yield some extra uh, from uh, financially um, over the next uh, few months, you think? Or No, I, I wouldn't say this is favorable to anyone. This is more a matter of damage control. <laughs> so, yeah. so is it extremely unfavorable or just less unfavorable? Uh, and for the carriers here, the, the name of the game is really try to limit costs. What they're doing, for example, when they're laying up of capacity now, or at least they're blanking a lot of sailings, you're seeing them introduce a lot of inducement calls, hmm. which is great for network integrity. As a shipper, that means you have to brace yourself for even longer transit times. Uh, but I think, to be honest right now, transit times and reliability is clearly not top of mind for anyone. So, so that's not really gonna hurt the carriers uh, all that much. You can then argue, with all these containers tied up, is there a profit to be gained from, for example, detention and demurrage? Mm. Right now, that seems to be very, very different from country to country, where there, at least from what I've seen so far, but I haven't made the detailed analysis thus far, in, that in countries where you have genuine lockdown, where you have curfews and people can't move out, we seem to be moving towards a trend where you are also waiving detention and demurrage for a while because there is a recognition that this is a force majeure situation. Yeah. So yeah. in the places where most equipment is tied up, then no, the carriers are not going to benefit uh, financially from that. And I would also have a sneaky suspicion that if you as a carrier try to profit off that situation, yeah. that would hurt you tremendously on the commercial side afterwards. Yeah, yeah, good points, good points. So what about from the shipper side here? Uh, what, what should they uh, keep in mind, be cautious about, or what should they expect? I mean, we even have a, the majority of our customer base is, is uh, Fortune 500 big global brands, right? Who usually don't look at the spot market uh, a lot anyhow because they run their tenders. But now that we're seeing on the mentioned corridors, we are starting to see such a big delta between the short-term market and where the long-term contract sits. Well, what's up for them? What do you think they're heading into? What they're heading into is an enormous amount of unpredictability. Uh, again, it could simply vary from one country to the next or even within individual countries. The, the, the key thing is on the short term, um, 
I would venture the assumption that a lot of also your customers, the big Fortune 500 ones, they're stuck with the situation. They have a lot of import cargo coming in and they have no real use for it. They need to look very hard at do you actually need them shipped all the way to the plant destination or do you want to avail yourself of the services some of the carriers are now providing where they're offering it to take it off in major transshipment hubs and leave it there for the duration because that might simply be a more practical way of storing the containers without incurring uh, excessive detention and demerge charges. That definitely has to be thought through. And then uh, I, I know this is difficult when you're standing in the middle of a hot fire, but look ahead, six, eight, 10 months, there will be a rebound at some point in time. And prepare yourself for the period where there will be significant equipment shortages popping up here, there, and everywhere. And as always, the thing here is you, you reap what you sow. So if you are very cutthroat now trying to take advantage of where rates might drop, that's all good for you right now. But rest assured, you will also come to the back of the queue if there's suddenly a shortage of equipment six, eight, ten months down the line. So is that is that the timeline you have a little bit in mind, uh, Lars, in terms of uh, when you believe we'll, we'll start to recover from this? Six? Yes, uh, uh, yes because I mean, uh, if, if I'm putting on my optimistic hat, Mm -hmm. uh, then I could see a potential rebound uh, somewhere in the beginning of 2021, but not before that. Uh, the reason for that timeline is not necessarily in itself related to the virus. Uh, let, let's be extremely optimistic and say, let's assume the majority of the outbreak is gone in two or three months from now. What then happens? First of all, we would then need to think, will consumers start buying what they used to do immediately when mm -hmm. the virus is gone? Right now, indications from China is absolutely not. We have one of the largest Danish clothes resellers, for example. They have 7,000 stores in China. And right now, they're saying sales are only at 65% of normal. So consumers would not go back to normal this summer. Secondly, if you look at the importing companies, for there to be a rebound, you would basically need to sit down as an importer, let's say in June or July, and make the call that you will assume Christmas will be fantastic and order a lot of import goods. Will you do that in June or July, knowing that this virus might very well come around for a second round towards the end of the year? I find that exceedingly unlikely. So from a container volume perspective, I do not see a rebound uh, for peak season 2020. But if we then get through the second round of the virus relatively well towards the end of this year, then I could definitely see you get this extremely strong rebound when we mm. then start in 2021. All right, so uh, that leaves me with two main things I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, and I, I believe you're sort of uh, painting a very accurate picture of, of what I believe myself as well. But but what does that mean for the carriers, and are they financially sound and, and, and capable to pull through a, a, such a long time period? It's already been difficult, right? And now we're talking end of this year before we believe um, potentially that this might turn around. Do, do the shippers need to worry about the financial uh, stability or uh, of the of the carriers? If you look at, at, at the carriers, uh, may, maybe one way of looking at it, think back to the financial crisis, which was extremely bad. Not a single one of the larger carriers went bankrupt during that period. Not one. <clears throat> uh, the carriers, at least historically, have been extremely good at getting access to additional capital or postponing payments so they could survive even enormously hard times. Yep. The question is, will they all pull through this time around again? Well, if you're in the worst case scenario, I painted where if rates collapse and the industry loses $23 billion, then all bets are off. Then it could be anyone that goes under. Clearly, yep. some are financially stronger than others as we enter into it now. And I would also feel relatively confident with the prediction that you will see some smaller carriers around the world that will lose their lives over the coming months. It's um, uh, it's it's super interesting, and I think you're touching on a very uh, important point. Back in '16, when Hanjin went bankrupt, the market had completely co collapsed on the rate side. It was yeah. uh, unprecedented. It was literally almost for free to move boxes from from one end of the world to the next. And I believe so far we haven't seen that at all. They've been really uh, good at keeping the rates up uh, uh, on a healthy level, and it's just the volumes missing. But the problem is, Lars, we, when you have fun, as I, I really enjoy myself here, we're running out of time. Uh, <laughs> it's It's been a full 15 minutes already. Any final comments uh, from your side as to what you would recommend shippers to, to keep in mind over the next few months? 
it, it is that exception management here is going to be absolutely key. There will be no predictability. There will be no way of having stable supply chains up and running until we get on the other side of the rebound. Fantastic. Lars, again, thank you a lot for joining. It's been a pleasure. And uh, just a reminder to everybody out there, to our customers in particular, we have still running our community uh, and a customer discussion forum on community.senera.com. So log in, keep the uh, conversation going there and post your questions and we will answer them. Uh, again, Lars, thank you. And I hope to speak with you again soon. My pleasure.